Welcome, everybody, to number 59 of the Roses and Rhetoric podcast. Joining me, my temporary co-host, Virginia, filling in for Joe for probably the next five to ten minutes as Joe tidies up some personal business. Virginia, how are you right now? I'm doing really good. How are you today? I'm doing great. Enjoying the uh, brisk, cold weather of Washington, D.C., which is where I'm shooting from right now in uh, the bomb shelter. As you can tell, I'm in in a a bunker right now, it, it appears. Um, but all is well. Good. Wait, why are you in Washington, D.C.? I thought you were a Texas guy. I, I am a Texas guy married to to what is currently a, uh, a D.C. gal who's up here working for the Fed. So I'm up here visiting for the next couple weeks. But the show must go wrong. And so here we are shooting in our in our still disparate locations. I believe that you're shooting from Portland, Oregon at the moment. So, yeah. Yeah, it's also, very, it's also very cold here, too. Um, I just started a new job, and one of my bosses actually lives in New York, so pretty close to Washington, D.C., I think. I, I, I haven't really been to the East Coast, to be honest, so I, I don't really know the area, but pretty sure it's pretty close, and me and her were a little bit arguing because I was saying Portland's freezing right now. It's been, like, in the 40s, like, 45 degrees the past, uh, like, two weeks, and she was like, Portland is not cold. And I was like, yes, I am so cold. So we had a little bit of a disagreement. Well, I I am from Texas where it is not cold. And I'm coming up north where it is. So my first stop was to go to L.L. Bean and get, get some winter clothes. So I finally got an actual winter jacket and oh. decided against getting a bean boot. And I'm just wearing my tennis shoes. And I'll tell you, that was a mistake. Because once the feet go cold, that's all she wrote. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, so I didn't buy gloves. My wife told me, you should buy gloves. I said, I won't need gloves. I never wear gloves. You're going to need gloves. And I didn't buy them. And I wish I had bought them. So if you're going to a cold place, wear warm shoes, wear warm gloves. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, really, really, if you're not used to cold weather, it's going to be colder than you would expect. That's what I've come to realize. So over, over prepare for it. In a pro move, Jimmy, is actually to get the gloves that you can text with. Um, yeah, so if yes. If you yes. take your phone at all, you can, you know, you don't have to take your gloves off, which is really miserable to do when you're really cold. Um, but but I think you can wear sneakers, actually, if you just get some wool socks. Yeah. Well, I don't have any wool socks. I have the same pair of dress socks. I'm wearing the same, like, five pairs of socks for the past five years. And, you know, they, they work well, but... You know, lo and behold, not met for the cold weather. So we're all slowly adapting, you know, and I, I, I agree with you on the texting and the gloves. So I had to do that. But um, but all in all, it's been a fun trip. So I'm happy to hear that your trip in Portland is going well. Also, I will. As a funny fact, I, I think, you know, people that are from Eugene, Oregon. Is that right? Yes. OK, so I think Eugene, Oregon is one of those small towns that somehow everybody knows somebody from because I was overhearing a conversation the other day. And I heard someone say, oh, I'm from a small town in Oregon. And in my head, I thought, I bet they're going to say Eugene. And then sure enough, they were like, it's called Eugene. And I was like, ah, everyone is is somehow from there, even though it's a small town. So another little fact that I'll put out there into the the world people to think about. That is funny. Well, so Eugene is where the Oregon Ducks, uh, University of Oregon is. I went to Oregon State, so I kind of have a little bit of a vendetta. Oh, so it's it's, it's not that small then. No, it's not. It's oh, like, well, then, never mind. Yeah, it's one of the bigger cities of Oregon. Um, I would say Corvallis, where I went to school, is a little bit more of the small town vibe. But, um, but yeah, for Oregon, it is one of the bigger, more populated areas. Well, then I take it back. What I just said is not that cool, and <laughs> that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll be wrapping up today shortly, anyways. No. Um, <laughs> Oh, oh, wait, one moment. I think uh, your real co-host is here. Look at that. Hey, don't, don't yeah. say real. We're all, we're all equal co-hosts here, except for me, who's a little bit above everybody else. But besides that, or, uh, joining me today is Carrot Top, joining me live from the studio. What I miss, what I miss. Some, some people's hair, as it gets longer, it gets curlier, and I think you might be in that category of human, because your, your hair has only gotten curlier as the longer that it's gotten. It seems like the longer it gets, the shorter it gets. Yeah, that's a good thing. It's always good to be adding volume to your hair. 
Yeah, like it doesn't my, go any longer this way. It like hits the shoulders and then it just goes outward. Yeah. My hair does the exact same thing, which is why I always keep it short. Um, no, Joe, it's good to see you again. It's been, it's been a few weeks. We've done a few weeks apart from each other. Um, scheduling, et cetera. Glad to see that you're back in the studio. Us, we're, we're back in the studio. Well, between the two hosts, our favorite type of episode. Yeah. Um, this could be the last time I'm broadcasting from the studio. <laughs> Anybody just now joining us this is also news to me as well. <laughs> oh, wait, from that location. Yeah, from this location. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. We're only episode. We, have, we haven't even, we have to at least go to 60. I mean, my God, it'd be embarrassing. Yeah. So, what, what do we got on the agenda today? I do have some some Joe's inbox items that need to be addressed. But Good. Well, what, what do we, what do I have today? I wanted to talk about, so I've been, I've been talking and kind of teasing. I got into a little bit of it on Joe Matt's episode a few weeks ago. The nice charming pick me up on totalitarianism. Always a fun read. Um, I don't want to go into that today, though I do have a few other things on it that I want to get probably on next episode. Um, let let your let, let 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 your charming roommate know that we can see the TV behind her and she's about to start playing Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. I don't have a roommate, but um, we don't we don't have uh, the licensing to show this video game on our we will get shut down. <laughs> so please let her know we are not licensed to show rockstar games on our channel without written consent from rockstar studios all right i'll let her know <laughs> also san andreas no they actually they remade it for the nintendo switch so it's got like all the updated graphics but all this same that's old good i actually thought san andreas was was actually of the three original that I kind of think of, like three in Vice City and San Andreas, I thought San Andreas was the best one. Yeah, um, it comes as a pack with uh, Vice City, yeah. San Andreas, and then Grand Theft Auto 3. But yeah, San Andreas is a good one. Tell her, tell her not to commit too many violent acts of or just actions in general while we're showing this. Um, yes. But like, like I was saying, I, I do want to get into that, but I've been traveling this past week, so I haven't really had a chance to do that. I thought today... I was thinking about a book that I was reading. I just finished it. People who don't know, I recommend this book. It's a nice one, actually. It's called In Retrospect. It's a book by Robert McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense under Kennedy and Johnson. And this book is basically a biography, just specifically about his time as Secretary of Defense during the Vietnam War. And um, there's a lot of lessons to be drawn from this book. None of them are very uplifting because he basically concludes that the Vietnam War was a mistake, which is great to realize after the fact. Um, but one of the things that struck me in the book as I was reading it was um, the importance of planning and what differentiates a good plan from a bad plan. And that was really what I was thinking about a lot this week because um, I think planning is the thing that comes up in a lot of our lives. And certainly kind of in the role that I have where I work, I kind of fit as like a project manager of sorts. And um, I would never compare anything that I did to the Vietnam War. I made that very clear. <laughs> However, I do, think, I do think that there are some lessons to be drawn from this when it comes to the plans. It, three, three things, plans, progress, and the importance of being very, very specific. And I think that is uh, the source of good planning. So that's what I wanted to talk about today, but in conjunction with your inbox queries, I will let, oh, that's my dog's dog, Peter. Don't be alarmed. I will let you drive the agenda. So which one do you want to go to first? Oh, those are really nice graphics on the new San Andreas remake. Right? Oh yeah, no, it's great. It's very impressive. It's good. It's almost GTA yeah. 5 style graphics. Um, yeah, let me run through the inbox real quick. I don't think it'll take too long. Uh, let me find it. So basically, last uh, I, I got some heat from last episode um, from like several people actually. But <laughs> well, I haven't watched this episode, so that's good. <laughs> it was uh, it was like a, a discussion on affirmations, basically, and like writing your goals down fifteen times a day until like, was was one of your affirmations to get heat from people. Did it come true or? Uh, you know, that wasn't explicitly mentioned. Maybe it was, uh, there's some some conscious happening. You were yeah, writing down controversy, controversy, controversy. 
But uh, in response to that episode, I did receive a few questions that I'd like to address. And talk well, is, it, is it, well, wait, so set the stage a little bit. Is it, are these people that routinely watch the show or do they tune in specifically to listen to you talk about that? Both. Do you know? Both, okay. Yeah. All right. So these are dedicated fans, I would say. <laughs> well, at least before they heard your episode on, <laughs> no, okay. Right. And, and just so, at a high level, the discussions over, you pick, a, if you have a goal that you want to achieve, you write that goal down 15 times per day, every day. And then um, essentially it, the goals will become true um, through the process of just setting your, your awareness for the day, like your reticular activation of what it's called. So like if you're in a crowded room, you can mm -hmm. oftentimes pick your name out of a crowded room being said, and no one else can pick up on it because you're crying. You're listening it. for it. And you're like, yeah. that's me. Okay. So, so you, so you said that and then people responded to you over fan mail. You know, never, no one ever sends me any fan mail. No one sends you fan mail? Never. Oh. And, and let me tell you, let, let me be very clear. I prefer it that way. <laughs> I don't want any fucking fan mail. Yeah. So. never be a Jimmy's inbox segment on this show. If anybody's listening to the show and thinks I should write him. Don't. <laughs> no, I think you should. I think anyone listening to the show should write Jim up right away. Yeah. That. Um, but so that's at a high level, that's what it is. It's writing down mm -hmm. your goals 15 times per day. And then um, just watching these things come true almost through like a passive subconscious process. And well, I gave some examples. didn't like that, I guess. That's yeah. Okay. Like I gave the example of like, that's how I quit my job and that's how I became self-employed. But if you want to listen more on that, you can listen to the last episode. Um, Which was 58. Episode, looking for it on the thing. Yeah. So some questions I received. Is it a religion? Um, no, it's not a religion. This, this idea exists outside the realms of uh, metaphysics or religion or whatnot. That's not saying it negates religion in any way. It's just different. It's not a religion. You don't see it as a religion, and, and that's fine. Right. There's nothing hocus pocus. There's nothing magic about it. There's nothing divine about it. Um, although I will say that I think that prayers are a form of affirmation in some way, in the sense that you're repeating um, similar things or similar requests or similar goals from day to day. And that over time, I, I think through a similar mechanism, you could get some, some benefits from that. So, but overall, is it religion? No, it has nothing to do with religion. Um, do you have to print or cursive write by hand? Can you type it? Uh, again, these things really don't matter. The important part is just like getting your system primed. I like the idea of like the cursive. Look, if anyone can still do a cursive G outside of the fourth grade, I mean, give me a break. I, I struggle with the cursive Zs. That's, I, I still can't do it. Oh, well, but that's not even a, yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah. yeah yeah but it doesn't matter you can type it you can cursive it you can calligraphy it comic sans wingdings whatever you want to use it doesn't matter it's just the act of taking that time to write it down every day is what matters um here and then okay next question um samples of other success stories so i gave a few of like scott adam's success stories but like uh, you know, where he, he cured an incurable voice disease, he became a famous cartoonist, he uh, got the scores needed to get into his business school, he did a whole host of things using this. Um, so, but outside of those examples, um, I don't really know if I can think of anyone else that's done this besides me, at least that I know personally. Uh, but from my own anecdotal personal experience, uh, I can say it works. And I would not be surprised if it worked for other people too. So I think a few people listen to the last episode and they're doing it. They're in the process of doing it. Maybe they could report back to the show and we can get some examples going here. So if you are writing affirmations, feel free to reach out to us. Roses and rhetoric at yeah. gmail.com. And not to me. <laughs> Jimmy Hackett at gmail.com. <laughs> we can get, get some fan mail going. We can get some more evidence, more examples. I'd love to hear the experience. Uh, next question. Can negative thoughts create negative outcomes? Yes, absolutely. This goes back to like people that are negative manifest their negative ideas into reality. Um, 
it also came to my attention that serial killers, they often uh, become obsessed with people and obsessed with killing people to the point where they're thinking about it or talking about it every day. And through that act, it can eventually lead to them committing their murders and killing the people they want to kill. So, yeah. Well, look, for them, that might be like it working. It's like, I really, I set my mind to this goal. Yeah. I told myself, I'm going to go out there and kill it. And then I did. <laughs> set yeah. that goal for myself. <laughs> And then next thing you know, they, they're doing it. So it can be used for evil just as much as it can be used for good. Um, I encourage it to be used for good, however, and condone the evil. Um, okay, what else do we got? You know, this doesn't always sound too, uh, too heated to me. Well, these are just uh, questions. Oh, okay. This all is, okay, okay. Oh, here's one. Can I focus on just one or can I use 30 sentences? For example, if I write 15 times per day, I will lose 15 pounds. And then another 17, I will work out every day. Um, not quite sure what this is saying exactly. I think it has something to say. Uh, is it any benefit to write it more than 15 times? And I guess the answer is, I don't know. Like this isn't really something you can test or study really reliably or scientifically. But anecdotally, 15 times is enough. Um, I think that it's more just about the consistency and taking the time to do it rather than the amount of times that you do it, that you write it down. So I would say 15 is enough. Um, and is it best policy to just focus on one? Yeah, absolutely. Like if you have your attention on like three different things, not only is it going to take you like an hour to write it out every day, but uh, I think it would distract a little bit from the main goal. Like if you could just zero in on one, I think that would be more successful than, than zeroing in on the other ones on a bunch of goals. But again, I don't have that much experience with it. I just have one example of it working um, personal to me. Still waiting for our fans out there to uh, give us their testimonies and their stories. Um, but yeah, this is something we'll keep track of and uh, we'll check in from time to time. But yeah, I think that sums up um, this episode of uh, Joe's Inbox. Joe's Inbox, very good. Um, very good. Well, I had a fun week. I told you I was traveling some. Mm. And uh, before I get into my project management thing, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, something you were, you were told me you were going to work on, and I think that you have worked on, and that I want to get some feedback on, which is your effort to slim down your traveling in terms of your luggage. Mm, yes. Now, I'd like you to share with me some tips, because I tell you something, I didn't do that, and I wish that I really had. <laughs> what, are, what are some things we can be doing here? And let, me, let me tell you why I'm asking this, because I, I will probably be traveling a good amount this upcoming year, and I... I hate how uh, much effort it is to get your bag in and out of an airport. That's really what it comes down to for me. Yes. Uh, I would say my first tip is don't unpack. <laughs> like yeah, once you get packed, especially for like your toiletries, just why not just live out of your toiletries bag? Why yeah. do you have to put things in a drawer? Just keep it there. And then if you got to go somewhere, it's easy. Right, you just yeah. No, that's, yeah, that's actually a very good point. Um, I would say that. And then the other thing is the you, you need to get the sectionals for the suitcase. You need to get the little individual bags so that you can organize things. Oh, interesting. Oh, interesting. interesting. Ma'am, like you need one bag for all your pants, one bag for all your shorts, underwear, whatever. Just these little like zip up containers, um, not hard case, but like just little bags. You can get them mm -hmm. on REI, Amazon, real easy. And it's the only way to stay organized because otherwise... You get somewhere, you want to pull out a shirt, you look for the shirt, you can't find it. You have to pull out the whole suitcase to get to this access to this one shirt. And then the next thing you know, like all your clothes are just spread out everywhere. Yeah. And it's in, you have to refold them to get them back in. So are you, are, are you a fan of rolling your clothes? That's what my wife does. She like rolls them into like little burritos instead of folding. Uh, yeah. So I actually was a big fan of rolling before I learned about the sectionals because, uh, with the sectionals, it's just a little bit easier just to get it all flat, like because they're yeah. all kind of rectangular shaped, so that works. But if you're not rolling sectionals, I'm all about rolling. Um, 
except for like some of like collared shirts and stuff it just completely just yeah it's hard to, it's hard to do that it's hard to roll a collared shirt and also if you get like a suit in there it's, it's a little awkward too yeah and it's like i don't iron so like no yeah doesn't end well for me yeah. <laughs> Whenever I'm ironing on vacation, it's always just turning the the shower on full blast heat and just hanging a shirt up in there or whatever. Yeah. Well, that's also how you and I would heat our dorm room at night. So it <laughs> <laughs> was it was sabotage the next morning. Then uh, more heat. All right, no, that's good. I wanted to get our viewers out there and remind us, remind you of that because we are coming up in a few weeks. Show it'll be time for new New Year's resolutions. And oh, uh, I remember the the. Do we have the, our old resolutions? Yeah. Why? Well, I, I yes. And then we'll have new ones. But I was thinking about the packing one because I think you know that's really something that uh, you know we're going to be at a practice on you know traveling mm -hmm. and it's going to be hard to get back into that groove. And I was just thinking, you know, that would be a nice thing to commit myself to would be to better to be a better packer this upcoming year because uh, I'm not good at it. I'll play that right now. I'm not good at it. Well, I think that thinking back, I think that was one of my New Year's resolutions was to never check in a bag. Yeah, that's right. It was you always wanted, which I thought was a great goal. I yeah. thought that was excellent. Yeah. And I mean, if they're short, I mean, there's even if it's a long trip, you can still do it. But yeah, find a backpack that can be like the biggest size allowable for yeah. checking in or for uh, not checking in, but carrying on and just pull your shit in there. Like that's that's the best way to do it. You, you know what I will go back on? And you know how much I hate admitting when I'm wrong, but I, but I, I will do it now here on the show. I, I will consider myself to essentially be a, 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 a backpack convert. I used to go with a briefcase as you know, now, 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 Joe, tell, tell the audience how many, for the, the lifetime that you've known me, I've been a briefcase man. Briefcase. For as long as you know me, I've, I've been, I've been a briefcase man. Yeah. And um, I still like the briefcase. I think that the briefcase has a certain kind of class to it, but I, I will concede to the practicality of a backpack and um, especially if you get one that doesn't look like, you know, some backpack equivalent of like a cargo short, I think you're, you're, you're okay. So it starts looking like cargo pants, like a freaking fort, you know, no one wants that. Yeah. Like unless you're literally in the military, don't wear the military backpack. You don't need it. You're not going to work. Fill out. The rucksack. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Different straps and velcros on, but I, but I, 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 I will say I think the backpack is nice. I'm wearing a backpack more often. Yeah, um, uh, briefcase is well, they're heavy first of all, which is they awesome. are heavy. But I mean, it, if you're wearing like some sort of formal wear, <laughs> kind of, a nice bless you. If you're wearing a nice shirt, it's uh, you really can't wear a backpack because you're just gonna like wrinkle it up, right? Yeah, like, uh, yeah. You gotta have the briefcase for that factor. But I mean, if you're not worried about that. Yeah, I mean backpacks are so easy. It's the easiest thing to carry in the world. Yeah, it's it's, it's pretty it's pretty nice. So I'll I'll admit that here for the first time, uh -oh. admitting a mistake. But no, it was it was nice. I've been trying to use the backpack more often, regular for traveling, which is I'm thinking about it right now. But I wanted to mention the traveling because you know we're coming up on. I'm, I'm putting it in your mind. We got to be thinking about resolutions for the upcoming. Year. So put that on the mind. Um, okay. Anything else from Joe's inbox? Probably going to be a short episode today as I am currently burning the travel hours, as it were. However, there were a few more things I wanted to talk about. First off, Listerine pocket strips. Let me tell you something. You think you're a man until you're one of those motherfuckers. Those things are fucking harsh, Joe. They're fucking harsh. Am I wrong? Are these still in production? I remember, yeah, but that I was my to... first thing that I thought. I saw this and I thought, first of all, is there still around these fucking menthol explosions in your mouth? Yeah, why don't, you describe, why don't you describe them a little bit? Look, anyone. here's the thing about these Listerine pocket chips. First of all, you think, well, it's a really good idea because it melts in your mouth. It does not melt in your mouth. It is fucking napalm in your mouth. It is sticky and it burns. It is sticky and it burns. It, first of all, and like, where does it stick? Everything it touches, your tongue, your teeth, the top of your mouth, the little grooves on top of your mouth. It's a perfect little place for this little little uh, uh, thing to accumulate. And it hurts. It fucking Flammies. hurts every time. And, and you take it out, you think, oh, it's a little, how bad can it be? Fucking horrible. So I had one of those today. I thought it was a it was fucking mistake. Don't buy these things. They're not very good. They're not very enjoyable. This you, got any more? Get in. you got any more? No. Actually, yes. I mean, let's, uh, let's pop one right now. Let's... Uh... 
Look at this little fucking thing. This is like the world's largest tab of acid. It's like a piece. It's like a piece of scotch tape. Oh, look now. Where is it right now? <laughs> right in my mouth, hurting me. Yeah, for anyone listening and not watching, um, Jim just put one of these uh, atrocities in his oh. mouth. Oh, horrible. Okay. Projects and specificity. Okay. I'll probably have more to say about the Robert McNamara book. I literally enjoyed it. I recommend people read it. A good example of, you know, history being kind of the uh, study of ideas unfolding. And a lot of ideas were at play during the Vietnam War. Um, but I was thinking about, you know, one of the things that routinely comes up in the book is that there were very specific questions that McNamara knew he needed to know the answer to in order to make a good decision. And not just him, but the generals, the president, whoever was involved in the decision-making process. But there was, and he uses this phrase often in the book, and I think we've all experienced it, but there's a kind of momentum when it comes to making decisions or like the trains already leaving the station. You kind of think, I, we, we might want to kind of slow down and think about this more as like, eh, but it's already kind of moving. And I think, I think this is a good example of, um, I don't know, Joe, this is a phrase that you've used before, but we kind of, we, we put limits on ourselves and they kind of like, they're like self-imposed. And I think, I think this feeling that comes about in projects or, and I being very careful here, obviously the Vietnam War was not like some project. It was obviously this very massive global event. I'm not trying to minimize that. What I'm trying to say is, even at the highest levels of very smart people, these kind of silly impulses still drive decision-making. And it's really always best when you find yourself in this situation in kind of in the, in a work environment, you call it like stop the job. And it's kind of a common phrase, but right. it's um, that we don't do it, that, that we just feel ourselves kind of compelled to kind of keep things in motion or something. And Obviously, that's not a good way to make decisions. And obviously, it's not really logical. I mean, it never really makes sense to go forward with bad information or not knowing a very important thing. But there's a kind of psychology to momentum when it comes to these things. And what was interesting is I was reading this book and I was thinking, this, this phenomenon affects everybody. You know, these are obviously intelligent people, but it affects all of us, the rest of us as well. And I don't know there's really a solution for it other than just to pay attention to it. And then to when you realize it's saying, hey, hold up. We don't know how we don't know this key piece of information. And we really shouldn't make a decision until we do. Um, which taking that thought even further, as I was thinking like, well, what would I describe a good plan as? And I would essentially describe a good plan as a series of very specific questions. And each part of the plan is an answer to that very specific question. And, I, and I, I think one thing that I thought a lot about when I was younger and that I think very differently about now that I'm a little bit older is when I was younger, I spent a lot of time thinking about, I think a lot of young people do, but kind of very like big questions. And I think in, in some ways, I think real progress is made by focusing on smaller questions, like finding really specific answers to really specific things. I think that's an important part of progress that may not be as fun or may not be as, um, as um, appealing maybe, although I think it can be, but I think, I think that's where a lot of progress happens is in finding very specific information and, and, and really, you know, it's like technology or science is, finding some specific answer and posing a very specific question, looking for a very specific answer. And I think, I think there's always value in trying to push, push a thing to be more specific. And uh, what came up in my mind frequently when reading Robert McNamara's book on this is that this is a challenge that they faced where they, they had, you know, very specific questions and they didn't really take the time to answer them. And that problem happened time and again throughout the unfolding of the war. And had they taken the time to answer those questions, events would have unfolded very differently. Yeah, and, let's uh, let's bring this home a little bit. Yeah. Well, first of all, how, how yeah. how's the Listerine trip? What's the status of that? It's gone. It's gone. I, I'm, I'm already my my eyes are watery. My 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 the ridges in my mouth have all cleared up. Uh, and I'm, I'm back. 
coffee breath is gone. Yeah, coffee breath is gone, and uh, is that I, apple cider? But yeah. Okay, and okay, so you're talking about having specific questions that you're seeking to answer through the the management process. What, yes. Can you give some, like an example, like a, a real yes. life, tangible example that we can? Sure. Have? Sure. So when you're, uh, I think like probably a really good example would be budget. This is a thing that whatever realm of business you're in is, and, I, and I've seen this happen in, in meetings my, myself personally, but I, I'm sure that people can relate to it as well. But um, I think, I think when there's a lot of things that are being discussed at once, it's very easy to, to jump from topic to topic to, co to the topic. And I, what I would think would be better in life for all of us, and certainly myself, is to try to do less multitasking, focus on one key thing, and be very specific about it. And with regards to pricing, um, it would be really trying to understand the, the, the true cost of something rather than just handling bills as they come. That would be, I guess, kind of the, the, the framework to have. But I was thinking more in terms of, of McNamara's book, you know, it was often this idea of like, well, what, what forces do we really need over in Vietnam? And it was always this process of like reacting and like generals asking for more troops and then getting more troops. And it was never, you know, what are we actually trying to accomplish? What do we need to accomplish that? Um, it was, it, it was frustrating from that respect because um, the lack of specificity allowed to kind of this ever-growing problem and that it was never really bounded uh, when they were well, making these decisions. Well, yeah, no, it's interesting. It seems like the, the Viet, well, a couple of things. So first of all, I wonder how much of this is like an artifact of uh, just a government entity running something. Cause like they're really, I mean, I don't know that much about the Vietnam War, but I assume that there really wasn't that much clarity and uh, visibility as to what the success criteria was, like what they were trying to achieve, which again, could make it more like reactionary. Like what, what is success? Like they killed this many people, they stopped this many Well, no, that was a big point too. Like that's, a, that's, a, that's very much a part of it. Like what are we defining as success? And even yeah. like that became like a moving target. And um, but I mean, I think that, that that phenomena isn't just for government. I mean, I think, well, I mean, like, I think it's hard to find. You can't fail. Like you can't fail as government. Right. I mean, you no, can't. I, mean I think they did, they, they did fail. <laughs> yeah, but, there, but there's no consequences for failure. Like we didn't go back and fire all our generals after like Afghanistan or after Vietnam. Right. Well, 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 what I would or, say the consequences were is that a lot of people died. If, if it was a company like a, a fortune 500 company yeah. or something like we would, they would just fire that the executives that were involved in that and move on. Like there's no, not as much like risk that you have to worry about. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think there's definitely risk. I mean, even politically, the risk is like getting voted out of office. But I think even more more acutely, the risk. But I mean, is, like the, the generals, like, for example, aren't elected per se, are they? No, no, but they can be dismissed or like asked to resign. Yeah, but again, it's more of a political ploy to get them out it's more of a political mechanism than it is like a per, like a performance-based mechanism well why well, i think i think uh people can be asked to resign from not delivering like, on results like i would take like this last afghanistan situation the withdrawal like mm -hmm. hate it or love it seems like something went wrong and no one got fired for it no one got in trouble it's just like oh no this is the way things are like, I can't see that same thing happening in a private industry. Like if some disaster happened of that equal magnitude um, in like a big company, private company, like someone's getting fired, someone's getting demoted, someone's getting reprimanded. Like it, it's, it's almost like they just got all, everyone just got a, whole, a pass for that. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I think the consequences maybe take longer to sort out, but I think... I think the bigger consequence of something like Vietnam is that you have for years, um, I do think it weighs on the nation's conscience. And I think people do. I don't think the nation has a conscience anymore. <laughs> well, but I'm going back saying to like to the Vietnam time, right? I mean, I, I do think, and certainly, certainly there was a consequence in how the nation came to view the war. 
Mm-hmm. And it certainly was a, was a divisive topic of the time. So, I mean, I think there's a real consequence there. Of course, the other one would be the, uh, the, the cost in money and lives. So well, I do, but, yeah. I do think that these things have consequences. I think that they do have, and that they are important. And I, I do think that, um, certainly in the time where it's unfolding, I, I, I do think that it, it becomes a thing like for like, like Vietnam divided the country, you know, it was uh, one of many issues at the time that divided the country. So I do, I do think that these things do have real impact. Um, what is interesting for this book, and I'll just give a little bit of history of the book, but this book was written several years after the fact. Uh, and basically it was Robert McNamara basically trying to explain after the fact what went wrong. So the book, the book is called In Retrospect. And it is very much, it is a retrospective on the events of the time. Um, and so on the one hand, we're all kind of grateful that he was willing to be as open and honest. And like several times in the book, this flat out says, we thought this and it was definitely wrong. And that, that kind of phraseology happens time and time again in the book. Um, so there is, there is kind of a brutal level of honesty in it, which is appreciated. But, you know, it doesn't really make up for the huge sacrifice that was entailed by it. And that it took you know, this lesson to be learned, I guess, is, is a tragedy in and of itself. Um, what, what was surprising for me in the book, again, though, is just this, this process where we just feel ourselves being compelled to kind of go with the flow to use a, I mean, a grossly inappropriate phrase for a thing like Vietnam, but that, that really was what was happening was that you had people in the room that had a mindset and that was just what was guiding the decision-making. And all along, there were thoughts of, hey, what if we're wrong? What if this isn't quite the right? But it's like, no, the, the ball is rolling. This is what we're doing. And um, I, think, I think to a lesser degree, you know, it's kind of like peer pressure almost. I mean, all of us have been in a situation where we're probably not comfortable doing something, but the yeah. group is moving. And that's, I mean, we read what Robert Cialdini talks about this in all of his books. He kind of the first people to get going and that kind of drives the crowd and, um I mean, that's very much a human phenomena, but yeah, you still see it today, right? Well, I, the example that he gave in the book in, in his book that I thought was like bone chilling and devastating was the, uh, the mass suicide of uh, the Jim Jones colony, where it's like, how do you get that, that many people to drink uh, poison, uh, you know, poison fruit juice? It's like, well, you get a few of them to drink it. And then you see your friend drinking it. Thought, well, how crazy can it be? They did it. I may as well do it too. And that's that's so on. And that unfortunately moves the herd. But the group um, thing. Yeah. So I mean, that's that's people who just were like they were just killing themselves. <laughs> I mean, it's like the most extreme version of this. But yeah, but there is there is one thing. That I don't even like using the phrase project management. I know I've used it on this. I don't. I don't even mean to mean to say it that way. But it's always trying to to feel that impulse when we're in groups and to 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 try to keep enough perspective on that phenomena would be one thing but the other is on the notion of of specificity and looking for specifics and being and, and, and trying to be keenly aware of when you don't really have a good specific answer, um, which is what I was trying to allude to earlier about uh, kind of maybe 20 year old me versus 30 year old me, probably more like 18 or something. It was a fascination with really big questions. And, and I, as I've gotten older, my, my fascination more is um, with what it really takes to understand something is usually you're gonna understand a very, very small piece of a, of, of a thing. And that's, and that's really very hard. There's a really great quote from Richard Feynman where he says that he, he knows what it takes to really know something. Now, Richard Feynman is a very, very smart man, but he was really only an expert in a very, very, very small subject. I mean, quantum physics was his expertise. Now, obviously, that subject has grand implications for everything, but Richard Feynman wasn't a paleontologist. He wasn't a sociologist. He wasn't any, you know, he was a physicist. But, but he knew, but he knew quite a bit about it. And I think, I think, you know, there's, 
there's something, there's this tension, I think, with having a mind that human beings have where we understand frequently the notion of being perplexed by, by things, that we, we are frequently unsure of how things work. And at the same time, we're also aware of our impending death. And so we, we are aware that there's a kind of, there's a, there's a clock ticking in the background. And so there's only ever going to be so much that we really understand and certainly very, very little that we ever understand in, in, in a great level of detail. And um, I think part of getting older is accepting that and saying, well, I may as well use that time for something worthwhile. And, and I think that means in most cases, something specific. And I, and I think that's what I'm trying to drive home today is this idea of pushing for specificity um, as, a, as a pathway for comprehension. If that all kind of makes sense. Yeah, it, it does make sense. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't think that humans are really equipped to understand reality. Like, I, I just don't think we are like, what we see through our eyeballs isn't really what's in front of us. And I think true. That's been- true. Yeah, it was certainly our, our five senses are not going to tell us what reality is. That certainly is true. That's part right. of what Deutsch just talks about with the failure of empiricism. Yeah, so finding this objective reality might be more of a myth. Um, it's all about just finding filters, worldviews, and filters that just work for achieving the goals that you're trying to yeah. achieve. I would, I would say rather than filter, and that doesn't quite capture. I think I like David Deutsch's the idea of explanations. That, that that I think is a good a good mindset to have on looking for explanations for things, and then gradually building from one to the other. And then questioning the previous one and you know that kind of unending process i think is a better a better a better phrase i think it's a similar idea but i, like, I think that the phrasing is better and then uh talking about how like during the vietnam war people were like kind of blindly doing things is what maybe i'm mischaracterizing what you said but they weren't really... i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't say blindly but i would say they fell under like some sort of group think spell you will yeah so the overriding concern at the time was this notion of like big C communism, right? So like the communists were everywhere and, and, and the Soviet Union did exist and they were certainly exerting pressure throughout the world and so were the Chinese. And so it wasn't like it was a myth, but it was, it was a, um, it, 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 certainly, it certainly led to a lack of being critical of, of their position. That's what I would, that's what I would say. And I think that's what McNamara would say. That was, it was, it, it caused a lack of being critical of what they were determining. And that's just, that's just part of human nature. Like you would see that. And I would see that at my job in the past is like, okay, we kind of have this, like, not arbitrary, but this, this goal that everyone's kind of working towards and no one really questions it. I would say that in general, maybe 95 Five, 97% of humans don't even question what they're doing. They just do it because it's the status quo and that's what everyone else is doing. Yeah, no, I think that's that's exactly on par with what what with what was being written in that in, in this book. Yes. Yeah, but I mean it's just like humans, like I don't know, like yeah, if it if we can influence that 97% or just well, I'm well, well so I think that don't I think that it's okay. I think we can, because I think all of us at times have been in that situation and all of us in times have been able to catch it when it was happening. We kind of felt ourselves being impulsed to it. So I think, I think the, the first thing that I would say is that don't, don't think of yourself, anybody listening who's like, I, I fell under grouping before and I'm done. I'm, I'm one of the sheep. Or, no, 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 no. All of us are in that group sometimes and probably almost always. I would think all, also at times, all of us have at times been outside of it a little bit and i think the real the real thing is is i think pushing for specificity helped but then the other is to understand to to understand that that's happening is i i I think it just it, it takes an awareness of kind of the the zeitgeist of the time like i i think if you would have asked anybody that was involved in these decisions make in all in all of these groups for like Robert McNamara or the, or the generals if you're to say look are you is your is your primary concern something like the communists take over that would have said yeah absolutely and I think it's like well all right so then do you therefore think that you might be overly sensitive to this topic since it's like your overarching concern for the world like I would think they would probably like for I'll give you an example of this I think most people are afraid of dying 
and that therefore it seems that people are probably going to be a little overcautious of dying because it's like we're all afraid of it. And so I think if people are aware of their beliefs, which I think is usually the case, then I think you can have them incorporate that into how they perceive things that go for or against their beliefs. I think most people could articulate what they do and don't believe in to some degree. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe I think that a lot of our beliefs are kind of imposed on us too. So like, sure, but we still believe them. Like, I, I think you would still be aware of your beliefs. Yeah. Even if they're imposed on you. Yeah, I, I would, I would agree with that. But in, in terms of the specificity, is that more or less related to like just having a, like a clear success criteria? Yeah. Well, I think that's definitely a part of it. And I think that was definitely lacking in, in the Vietnam decision-making rooms. And I think uh, it would have been really important and also to define, well, why is this successful for us? You know, one of, the, one of the concerns for Vietnam was this notion of the domino theory, that if Vietnam fell, so would all the other countries. And that was questioned sometimes whenever to a high degree. And later on, they were assessing that probably wouldn't happen. And that's probably not a thing that we need to worry about with Vietnam. And so I think, I think really the, the heart of it, and this goes back to David Deutsch, but then also kind of back to what I was talking about with Hannah Arnott on a few episodes ago with Joe Matz, but to always find yourself questioning your premises and to never stop that, especially when they have tremendous cost. When you're talking about sending thousands of people to Vietnam to fight in a war, nothing should be just be taken for granted. Everything should be being questioned, including is this war necessary? And if the answer is ever no, stop. <laughs> but I think, I think the, the lessons of an open society of conjecture and criticism, and really the criticism part is probably the most important, is, uh, should always, always be in play. And um, especially when the costs are as severe as going to war and, and staying in a war. I mean, because yeah. Robert McNamara, this war went on after he departed from the Johnson administration, continued for many years after the fact. So, but I think, I think having, a, having a good success criteria, continuously refreshing and checking that success criteria, but then also really put, like really pushing for, for specifics, really, really trying to push for specific answers and, to tie that back into the thing I was talking about earlier with the notion of progress is um, trying to see progress or trying, trying to see a path of progress as answering a question no one's answered before or providing, or providing a better answer to a question someone has already answered. Think of it in those ways. And I think, I think sure. you're on the right track. Sure. I like it. I'm going to avoid those dream pocket strips. That all helps. <laughs> We kind of sponsor the show, by the way. We might have to order that. Yeah, not not after this. They won't. Worst, the worst. But wait, let me let me say something real quick. It's kind of a random episode of sorts, but I wanted to say, of course, now a few months ago, Norm Macdonald died, uh, yep. and for people who I think probably would suspect that I'm a fan of Norm Macdonald, I certainly am, and uh, I uh, I'm, I'm very I was very sad to hear that he died. I think that he will be remembered as a living legend who is no longer with us. R.I.P. 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 Funny guy. I'm a big fan of Norm Macdonald. And he uh, had a, he had like a weird sense of humor. Like he was yeah. one of the most politically incorrect people I would see, but he somehow always pulled it off. Well, the way, the way that I was describing Norm Macdonald in my own life is that he's my favorite comedian whom I have no desire to emulate. I, I don't, I don't really don't consider him any kind of influence because I don't, I don't know how he would be one. I don't know how anybody could be influenced by Norm Macdonald because he's just so bizarre. Um, you can imagine being influenced by like a Jerry Seinfeld, like I'm going to observe things better and keep a more open mind and I, or more uh, critical mind or something. But for someone to tell you, it's like, I want to try and be like Norm Macdonald. You'd be like, what does that even mean? What are you going to, how would you, you know, it would just be some lame impression, I think. So, yeah, he just has such like a unique form of humor. But I think like him and like maybe Dave Chappelle are the only ones that can get away with some of the things they say. Although Dave Chappelle didn't really get away with uh, his last. Yeah. 
I yeah, know, from, from what I've been told. I uh, I almost never listen to stand up. I, uh, I I generally don't find stand up very funny, and I think it's usually too long. I listen to clips of it sometimes, but I, I rarely listen to a full show. Yeah, it's almost never. The last the last full show that I listened to on stand up comedy, I think. Well, no, this wouldn't have been the last one. Let me let, let me let me set phrase like this. I remember when I was a kid and I had my iPod, I had three comedy albums on my iPod. Two were Jerry Seinfeld and one was Dane Cook. So, I mean, that's how long ago my now I, I've listened to some of the Netflix specials recently, but uh, not many of them. And I usually don't find them very funny. I, I just I don't think Santa's very good. So I'd, I'd say with the exception of Dave Chappelle and Carrot Top, obviously. I don't okay, right, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really watch Santa either. <laughs> Carrot Top. I don't have the attention span. Yeah. Very good. Um, okay. Those are those are the two things that I had. I I to the audience, I apologize. I have been teasing and I have talked about it a little bit, but I, I do want to get more on the Hannah Arn Arndt book. I've just been you know, kind of traveling this last week and so I haven't had time to really sit down and get my thoughts organized on it, but I, but I am doing that. And I have, uh, when I had Joe Matz on, we talked about it a little bit, but I, there are, there are some nice things in this book that I do want to get into in more detail. And then, um, um, what, well, I don't know what I said. And then period, that's what I wanted to do. So we'll, we'll, we'll be looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Um, okay. Joe, anything else before we wrap up? another successful episode of this podcast i think that's good um we'll be broadcasting from arizona next week very good you'll be back in the saddle in texas or are you going to be in dc you said i'll be next episode we do i probably will be in houston because we'll probably do it on sunday so yeah i'll probably be back in houston so it should be fun back in back in my local time zone so um number 59 in the bags everybody hope you all enjoyed it uh Appreciate you bearing with us. It was always fun to hear from Joe's inbox. Um, and follow him on Instagram and on Twitter at Jose4 underscore Cuervo. Follow us at Roses underscore Rhetoric, Instagram and Twitter, and on YouTube, of course. Until next time, I'm Jimmy Hackett signing off for Joseph Stanford saying ciao.